What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Far Drop It. I'm Scott here with Mike LeDrew, as always. And today on the Elder Scrolls podcast, we are talking vague. And I mean really <laughs> vague. We're talking about ancient gods. So this episode's going to be a bit of a sort of theory crafting, stringing things together. You're, you're sitting in live on our sort of discussion. Basically, we wanted to discuss some of the most sort of ancient and obscure gods, like we know in things like in the Aelid Sorcerer um, video, I talked about there's this there's Flower King, Nilakai, and, and some insect god that's sort of unnamed and not talked about. In the new Fargrave DLC, there's these big giant skeletons that fought over this plane of oblivion and it's basically you know there's there's a lot more uh, metaphysical room in the elder scrolls universe than we think there there are a couple of things we can preface and one is that this calpic cycle of the the elder scrolls it's been going on for thousands of years gods will come in and out of popular belief some will be forgotten entirely others will just kind of fade away a little bit sometimes a culture will drift away from one like the nords drifting away from the animal totems towards the more imperialized version and then on top of that when talking about daedra the idea that there's only 17 daedric princes it's like that's a very mortal thing to say it's like oh this is what we know therefore that's everything beyond our world in the void of oblivion there's millions and millions of realms a bunch of races that can just be invented at any point it's like so the doors are open i've got a cool the doors of oblivion i've got a cool idea I'll, I'll see what you think but just bringing that up made me think of imagine if the so the current cap where we're in you know there's the 17 data princes that you know of the most and all of that kind of stuff but I like to imagine, or it might be interesting to think about this, but each Kalpa, like things can drastically change. Like one of the most common ones we hear about, you know, the um, Mythic Dawn commentaries with the Tyrant Dread Kings and so on. And the Molag Bell was their chief then, right? But it would be interesting if every single new Kalpic cycle, basically the gods, you know, are fighting or scraping to basically keep relevance in the new mm-hmm. ones. So before Molag Bell, like, you know, with common themes of like domination, but Molag Bell was like the the Dreg King sort of chieftain and so on. And then he, you know, maintains his relevance and, you know, through the vampirism and domination and Kolaba. But it'd be interesting to see that if some of those Kalpic cycles happen, but previous ones like gods get like lost and left behind or they're no longer relevant in this new world mm-hmm. and this new iteration. Of- Based on the, like the happenings of the last cycle. Yeah. So, so it's kind of yeah. like they're all fighting for a, I mean, this is a really weird word to use, but like a market share yeah. in, in the minds of the citizens of Tamriel and all the beings on Nern. And then at the end of the Look, cycle, whoever's got the most gets more power going forward. Is that, mm-hmm. is that kind of what you're saying? Well, you know, uh, the way I see it, which kind of plays into a similar idea, is that Tamriel is the arena and essentially the gods are the wrestlers in the Royal Rumble. You know, some... <laughs> This year, or this Kalpa, this gen- this version of Mundus, different gods play a more important role. If Molag Bal was involved in the creation of Lig, he was an Aedra. He was a big part of it, and the reason it was set free was because it got, it, the power balance got a bit too out of control. Well, what I was saying, like, just to clarify there, too, what I was sort of saying, too, is, like, I agree, and what I was sort of saying is, like, so, say there's a previous Kalpa, Molag Bal shifts his sort of form and stuff and maintains relevancy into the next one. But perhaps, say there's a lot of water on this Tamriel and this like big ocean. Say there's a Daedric Prince of Coral. <laughs> but that Daedric Prince loses its relevance this time around because the dregs have been reduced to nothing and maybe it doesn't work. And so basically that becomes like one of the forgotten or sort of ancient kind of gods that's lost of previous Kalpas. So theoretically, mm-hmm. it could be where you have this idea of like um, all of these sort of unnamed like insect gods or something and maybe it's earlier closer to the dawn or something and, and they can fight it all the- out to see who wins in the next iteration yeah mm-hmm. it's one of those questions you hear a lot is why is there no sea god and it's like well chances are there is or was but right now they're they're not powerful or they're not relevant mm. um but yeah the, the 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 gods we know and have defined are very limited to the current history of tamriel i which is nothing in the grand scheme. I suppose you could also think that some gods who you might think would be popular could get displaced. Like if we're looking at this whole idea of worship creating power, then perhaps in the case of a sea god, you have to think, well, who would worship a sea god? And I guess the Mm -hmm. first thing that comes to mind is sailors. But Mm. if another deity such as Kine or or Kinnereth kind of, you know, wins in, in the relevancy battle, and basically because of winds and things like that and nature and such. And so the sea god isn't really needed to be worshipped. 
Mm -hmm. And also the, the most intelligent life being dregs in a previous Cowper. Dregs have been kind of really torn down and they've been fished almost, you know, not only did they fall from grace from the from a different cowper but they were being fished by the dunmer until they were essentially close to extinction and you don't hear much about them so perhaps they have a god that we don't know about but we're not really in contact with them anymore at the end of the day it's we everything we know generally comes from the same kind of cult, cultures and their histories and you know so an imperial the imperial library will be full of things from an imperial perspective high elves with their crystal-like lore, their tower, will be full of their versions of events. And if there's a sea god who's very relevant to, say, the Slode or to the Dregs, how much do we really know about those races in this history we have? Not much. And we probably don't know a lot about their worship and things like that too, which could also explain an absence of a sea god. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the only thing I can think of is there is a, like, tads of extra. Hermaeus Moor in Khajiit Pantheon gets a little of his library under the sea, mm -hmm. you know, next to a mm -hmm. pineapple kind of thing. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but he... Uh, and then also, uh, like, Azura goes and visits and so on, sort of connects them. But we can kind of infinitely talk about, I feel like, different uh, Kalpas and so on. And this is all... This is where, like, all Elder Scrolls galore gets really, like floozy wazzy kind of thing because you can't really when, when we're talking about most gods and lore and everything we're talking really in reality from the end of the dawn era to now and, and like time because like even concepts of um like aka the akatos kind of thing and you've got like um oriel akatosh and um and alduin those sort of like ideas are contingent somewhat on like kind of the nordic kind of understanding akatosh as a dragon conceptually and like but then again because it's a god of time it's like cycles and maybe that's the cycle over and over and over but then again you've also got like the red guards who go it's a satical it's not even this sort of other dynamic so it, it all gets really like confusing so maybe um instead i mean unless we can always dip back to it but maybe it would be a good idea to talk about the most ancient sort of societies that we know of and perhaps their gods and sort of string to together theories and so on mm. without mentioning the things that are that are pretty much um wholesale so that's just sort of continuing so sort of like elven gods like Oriel, like we very much mm -hmm. know about it, like Oriel or, or even the nordic pantheons as such but more so there's interesting stuff to talk about or in there, like animal totem kind of stuff. There's the needs and stuff with their star worshipping. And then there's some interesting ancient things, but let's go sort of Merethic era and backwards further and sort of see, and we could even start with the dawn, which um, is that kind of weird time where you've kind of got Tamriel as a whole, um, which would be uh, interesting. Because even there we've got what they call like old Elnafe or, or, you know, there was when all the land was whole, when the elves, well, the... Uh, well, sorry, I've got the just the. I've, what's the opposite the, of wandering elf affair? I've completely the old. It is old elf. That's yeah, right. It it's is. the same yeah. land as the name as the land. But anyway, um, they were there, but they would have been uh, worshiping or, or practicing their religion or whatever in a very similar way to supposedly how the Sijic Order do it now. Mm -hmm. Because remember, even the, the strict idea of sort of like Oriel and the, and the eight or the eight or whatever and how they worship at the Somerset Isles today is a deviation from their ultimate roots in a way. It's sort of like a worshipping of only the um, ancestors of the greatest members of society. So even back then it would have been different. But there were still elven gods like Aurelus sort of fight against Shore and um, Lorcan in that war. But then we get to the Sundering and stuff and that's where we kind of get to the more interesting stuff because it sort of seems like at least Oldma or... High elves or whatever, as we know, are gone. And then they find Somerset Isles again. Nords and all of that are over in Atmora. And then there's also these needs. And there's I, there's two ideas around, like there's the, there's either the Atmora and migration kind of theory or that they were always there. And I used to buy into the Atmora and one far more, but I feel like um, there's a few things that have been added to the law that make you question that, especially the Bosma origins and the Khajiit origins, both of which sort of assume that elves were always there in Tamriel and that the High Elves story isn't as, you know, concrete and perfect. So, I don't know. It makes me think. I, I, I think the idea, because when we talk about the Elnafe Wars, it very much does become a case of, is this what actually happened or is this kind of a metaphor for what happened? 
So when you have the idea that the angry gods pull sections of the land under the sea, which is why we have the distinct islands that are all separated and the wander, wandering Elnafae spread, um, the old Elnafae believe in their their perfect homeland, their utopia of old Elnafae, when it seems it seems suggested that old Elnafae is just Tamriel. So the idea that everything originated there does make sense. And if there was a physical sinking of land under the oceans, that would explain why Atmora would be separated, for example. But perhaps at one point they weren't. Well, yeah, And it's as a result of that Nothing Nothing too, like Atmora, they used to be called Altmora and so on. The elves used to have mm-hmm. a kingdom there and the Norns had to fight them off. And there were also elves in Yukuda, even left-handed elves. So there were kind of elves in a bunch of different places that got... Um, Done off. I, I did have like one. Here's an, one interesting thing, maybe to spin some conversation. But working out of that that sort of analogy of like, you know, how the Nords basically say that they were breathed onto the throat of the world, which you know they call Skyrim, and created by kind. There is a way. I did some like we. It was a video. I forgot one. I think it might have been the Secrets of Edmora video from like 2019 or something. But basically, there's an idea that you could have. Um, they were breathed onto the world and created as Nords and stuff to fight against the elven gods and stuff. But then basically they then get trapped on the other side of over, up that more away and then the sinking happens. So then when they actually do return, it is a return to the place that they mm-hmm. were actually created there. And there's some funny, interesting like interactions between the gods where you have in the Nordic pantheon, we know that there's... Kine is the wife of Shaw, their sort of main one, but then also Mara um, being the uh, concubine, concubine for sure. But in Auriel, in the in the Elven pantheon, Aunt Mara is the wife of Auriel or so on. So I sort of had this idea that like, what if Auriel starts and he has Mara as a concubine, but then Sh- as, as a wife, but then Shaw takes Mara as a concubine. She said she's like cheating on Auriel with and goes to, to his side and then there's a big war and everything happens and the big you know Shaw gets killed and all of that kind of stuff but it explains sort of Mara's position in in both different mm-hmm. sort so, of so this pantheons. is why the elves are so angry <laughs> yeah because <laughs> he got cucked yeah <laughs> or, <laughs> or, or, or Auriel got cucked by Shaw and that's why everything happened welcome to the <laughs> fudge muppet older scrolls law podcast <laughs> but I mean, yeah. that's almost kind of revenge as well. If if you take it all the way back to Anu and Padamai, if you have kind of Anu becoming Anwiel, then Auriel and Padamai becoming Sifis and Lorcan, Lorcan or Shaw taking Auriel's wife as his concubine is kind of like revenge for Padamai's rejection from Nerni when Anu loved, well, sorry, when Nerni loved Anu, they created the world and Padamai was sent away essentially and would, yeah. was rejected. Yeah, it, it, there's a lot of interesting um, interplays like that and connections. It's it's fun to try and actually make a um, like a, a chronological tale of everything, but um, we know that time can be a bit a little crazy in the Elder Scrolls. But one thing to actually we can isolate to like further isolate discussion is we can look at the gods. So the Elven gods are like fairly preserved, the sort of like Oriel kind of stuff. But the Nordic gods are you know, there's somewhat preserved and so on. But if you go further back, there's this kind of animal totems and each one of the gods correspond to it. So sort of the Atmoran religion. And I guess we can kind of like talk about the animal totems of Atmora because if we isolate the non-Elven factors of of um, of Tamriel that, like, that's now in the religions and so on, like because the divines is a combination of both, we can kind of look at like what sort of came from Atmora and stuff and sort of speculate. And I don't know if you guys have any way you want to start before. Well, anyway. in terms of the Nords or just... Well, animal general? totems. Well, I have I have one area, one prompt, which I just think is interesting. But Debella is an exclusively, what seems like an Atmoran god of origin. That basically that she came from... In, she's only in the Divines because of the synthesis of the two. But Debella is really only found in the Nords pantheon and that Morans before it. And that's how it got into the Imperial divines. And it's just, I find that I have sort of talked before. It's interesting that she's a goddess of um, beauty and stuff all throughout the world and so on and central instruction. And you could even argue that leads to procreation and so on, but these are also all essential elements of mortality and sort of enjoying mortality and that what they exist on, which would be completely antithetical to an Elven sort of. I, I also find that she's 
in terms of the the war between elves and men, which you can then apply to the first era with the Aelids and the Elysian Rebellion, is that when Elysia is creating this cosmopolitan crossover religion that would become the Eight Divines, Dibella is a perfect example of one of the Nordic gods that isn't extremely confrontational and wouldn't really evoke anger from the alien vassals that she's trying to appease as well. You know, say you were to bring in Sun or Stun or one of the warrior gods, like the the people who carried a shield alongside Shore in the battle, you can see why it would be very problematic for them to be maintained in the religion, whereas Dibella is more about beauty and love and art. Yeah. So... It's, it's easier to pull off, I'd say. It's and interesting, speaking of Debella, that um, potentially, and this isn't rock solid, and I'm sure we'll talk more about the Reachmen later, but there is that Debella shrine in Skyrim that the mm. Reachmen have kind of decorated slash desecrated. Like, it's hard, because Reachmen are known to do kind of, you know, by um, normal standards, gross things. Mm. But to them, it may not be gross. So there's this statue there, and they've covered it in blood, and there's like, you know bloody bones and ribs and skulls and stuff all around it to me it looks more like a shrine like they've got the candles there and everything still it um, could be. It's, it's not, not like they've just the pulled it down and and destroyed it well i i gotta if you want do you want to play the symbolism game a little bit further but debella is also as an animal totem is depicted as a moth and let's go what's the moss what's the significance of moss in the Elder scrolls is the ancestor moths and the ancestor moths and connect to being connected to um the elder scrolls and like the reading of elder scrolls and you could even look at that as like maybe the fabric of the realm or something like that but uh, i was trying to sort of string together some um theories and stuff and i'm not i'm not sure like maybe even maybe even like moths being attracted to light like magnus or so on or like enjoying the whole thing i i remember reading somewhere a theory about I can't remember how well put together it was or well thought how thought out it was, but like Debella being the wife of Magnus or something. Mm. And then that's why mm. she's, and she's actually, which would be different. Maybe it was her pining after returning to Ethereus. So I'm not sure. And like a moth drawn to that. I don't know. It gets very into the. Would that be like Meridia's si mom then? Meridia's mother. Yeah. I guess adopted mother. Yeah. Like if that's how it works. Cause remember, and, for everyone listening, Meridia was once a Magna Gi, which is somewhat of an Aedric entity, and then became a Daedric prince. You know what I mean? So, like, just to show how, like, arbitrary those terms are and the idea that there's only, like, 17 or, or 60. I mean, when you have 17 Daedric princes, it kind of ruins that sort of perfect, you know, metaphysical wheel image of, like, oh, there's the eight spokes and, uh, and so on. Um, yeah, it's like 16 and a half in a way. Yeah. It, you have kind of one split down the middle. Yeah. But, yeah, it all, it all kind of doesn't really make sense when you when you think about it like that but i mean something about I, this is just pure speculation but you can also see why the nords would associate debella perhaps with the kind of moths the ancestor moths the elder scrolls the somewhat all tied to creation is that humans very much see creation and tamriel as a beautiful gift that was given to them and there are arguments we can make which we've made before about the universe being a song Mm. And Debella is the patron of, you know, aesthetics and art and, and expression and beauty. And and it's it's a very human thing to see Tamriel as all of these things as opposed to a trap. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. And I... Yeah. Uh, why are we, I was thinking of that insect god that they worship. Does someone mm -hmm. have the quote right there? I've got the quote, yeah. The it says, from the Adabala, the flower king Nilakai made great sacrifice to an insect god named Lost, which is in reference to the alien king, the flower king. Yeah, and that was in like king. a brackets, like name Lost, or parentheses, like a... Yeah, 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 yeah so yeah. Lost, they, they yeah. don't have his name anymore. Yeah, um, but yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a stretch. Just go, oh, moth, insect kind of connection or something. Maybe it could be developed. We we speculated about that. Um, I, f I feel like the speculation has been spread out across multiple videos um, about who that insect god is. And I'm pretty sure there was even a talk with uh, Reddit AMA or something with Michael Kirkbride maybe. And I think it was that was mentioned and he even sort of was leaning towards the idea that, you know, there could be more. Some gods don't have to necessarily be a Daedric Prince. It doesn't have to be Mephala mm -hmm. or Debella or anything like that exists. Do you think that it could be uh, Namira somehow? 
it could be, but I feel like it's just it's the like Namira being associated with um, insects. Slugs but, and... Yeah, but also in the way like that the Reachmen see um, Namira as this kind of like lady of life and death. More, um, you know, like mm. think of like maggots eating a corpse and 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 the cycle of life going on. Um, in a different way to the how other cultures just see Namira as this like god of gross stuff. Another but, thing to support that too, could, it was the men of Gi they sacrificed, right? Wasn't mm-hmm. it? So as well as a bunch of different Nedic tribes. Yeah, well, if you can assume, okay, maybe less so. But the men of Gi being named, it's interesting if you were to go like so. Men of Gi, you would assume need to worship Magna Gi, perhaps. Men of Gi, men of Ket, oh, Al Hared. Actually, the way it is phrased, the way it's phrased does. I think it specifically says it was the men of Gi who were being sacrificed by him. Because it's just a long list of of Nedic tribes. But then when only reason the men of Gi are mentioned, the saying it is Namira as sort of an ancient darkness being like, mm-hmm. and you know, you, and some people even so closely associate her with the void or the primary mm-hmm. of chaos dark whatever you could use it as the antithesis of the men of gi which is kind of like light or line to theory so you could kind of you know which is anu so you could kind of almost the sacrifice could have been for namira as the insect god then or something but do you know what i mean like the mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. First light. i mean we could, we could we, there's a few things the insect god is just a name so it's it's this elusive insect god that we can keep in the, our mind to speculate but i guess what's also interesting is it depends whether you buy into the Atmoran migration sort of stuff, which I'm, I do and don't. It depends of the needs coming to, to, um, to Tamriel rather than them actually being native already being here. What's interesting is to to think about what kind of religion the needs may have had, or so basically, like if you can think of it in Cyrodiil, like pre Aelid, um, uh, slavery and so on, but almost before like the elves colonized broadly, um. You could, there's, there's only a few examples of where we can think about it. Stars seems to be a decent part with the Duraki needs, the star worshipping stuff. And um, and if you attach the men of Gi to that, you've also got like, there's another needy group of star worshipping. And I think also that just evokes like, you know, uh, in our real world, humans like forever have looked to the stars and, and, and the heavens and so on for like, you know symbols and, and they will use them for navigation and so on but it, it's got a very ancient feeling to say oh star worshippers you know what i mean but perhaps um magna Gi, um and the stars in general um played a bigger role amongst some of the nidic tribes because if you think about it what other gods would they necessarily um have in a way it is kind of parallel to you know i'm not an expert on ancient history in our own universe by any means but but prior to more kind of civilized, documented religions, it, it was very much about stargazing, you know. That, but before we knew more, when when um, technology was less advanced, it was it was gazing to the heavens and seeing symbols in the sky, and you could see that very much being the case for these early cultures before the civilized elves brought their society over. Well, I'll throw I'll throw another thing at you too to consider. Um, I, I agree, and and maybe there is more daedric worship amongst the common needs than you'd think and the reason i'd suggest that is um because amongst the reachmen and we have there was idea that i think we posited in one of the previous podcasts mentioned that the reachmen got all of this daedric worship sort of from somewhere um and then uh, you would assume that it's from their ancient societies, the, the sort of religions that have always been there. Because when you consider that the people who colonized that area, Imperials, Nords, and Elves, share none of this sort of Daedric fascination. It's kind of a mm-hmm. uniquely thing. And maybe it's been almost a, a symbol of resistance and survival and has been for the Reachmen. A lot of their gods are related to that. And if we were to consider that Adra and Daedra as a dynamic of basically good and bad sort of came along with um, the Elves of Somerset, um, who sort of develop this sort of uh, idea and then they go forth. Whereas you find people like uh, groups like the Khajiit and also the Reachmen that don't make these distinctions. They just, everything's a great spirit. It's big, but they don't have this really like, oh, this Daedra, they're evil, they're off limits. So a lot of early needs, especially when you think if you were to go really like primeval sort of like hunter-gatherer style, like her scene and gods like that would be very prevalent. And if you consider in... In Skyrim, there were even Nedic groups that got pushed out by Nords later that that hunted 
in those areas. And then perhaps some of these ancient artifacts like Hercene totems and stuff like that are actually more related to them. Um, and also it's proximity, it's close to the reach. But basically my suggestion would be that the, that the reach because of its location almost becomes like a little bit of an isolate it's it's been mm-hmm. conquered multiple times but and has preserved some of the religion and stuff or some of the religious elements that might have been further spread across um Termaria. well and when it comes to daedric princes as well prior to um alicia's covenant with akatosh and you can make an argument for the lunar lattice with azura you have examples like uh, one example being Lamey Bal and Molag Bal walking on Tamriel as a man, where there wasn't quite so many boundaries stopping the Daedric princes from coming along and having their impact on mortals. You've also got obviously Boethia swallowing Trinamac, and it was much more of a free for all. And if you've got mainland Tamriel, where all of these Nedic settlers have predated the the elves coming along. And you've got Daedric Princes who can just walk around and influence people however they like, with the Aedra freshly having just committed all their power to creating this world. You can see how Daedra worship would pick up before Elven Aedric influence. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when, like, I mean, we always say, like, a lot of the Aedric, like the Divines or whatever, are kind of like vague and also uh, you could also say a lot of them are of higher civilization if you want to use that term anyway like if you were to look at like you know zenithar and like you know it's, it's like there's like industry and commerce and then there's mm-hmm. like you know it's julianos of like academics and all of this kind of stuff like a lot of the divines um wouldn't really have a lot of relevance perhaps outside of things for example like kinnereth and kine like maybe you could make the argument that kine was relevant to the early um cyrodiilics um, this early needs, even because just even how they refer to like, even in their faith now, Mora House, Son of Kine and so on. Whereas they haven't had at that time that like combination of the Nordic sort of bits mm. and pieces, well, you know. And even with the Aedra, seeing things through a much more uh, cosmopolitan imperial lens with the uh, with the Nordic totems, oftentimes when we see one of these Nordic totem gods become a part of the mainstream eight divine religion there's a lot of similarities but it's more just kind of making things slightly less barbaric you know like stuns telling them to take prisoners of wars become become stendhal's merciful forbearance for example and then janal's hermetic orders is a bit more civilized when julianos is teaching about magic yeah so like in the ancient version is kind of there are very similar ideas at play the only difference being that it's been kind of imperialized, which a lot of history is. Yeah, I think a lot of the ancient things as well, not having that same kind of like good evil kind of like um, duality, like it has to be this or it has to be this, which is largely something that elves introduced. You find that a lot of the ancient interpretations of Daedra or not even necessarily ancient, but just interpretations where they don't have that strong sense of these are the good gods and these are the evil gods. The interpretations of them aren't that evil and i wonder if or, or not as evil you could say and i wonder if the kind of idea of like uh, myth making reality and worship almost shaping the way that a um god manifests on tamriel has something to do with that almost like mm-hmm. once you decide these are the evil gods and then people go and worship them as these more evil and sinister beings, they kind of embrace this new identity and the worship almost empowers that. Whereas you look at cultures like the Khajiit, for example, where, you know, the Daedra they worship aren't as, you know, sinister in the same ways. Or even you go and look at, like we were talking about the Reachmen, where um, Meirun's Dagon arguably has a stronger focus on like ambition and even just like his kind of sphere of like um natural disasters and things like that you can imagine the reachman praying saying you know please don't have a landslide come down and kill us i wouldn't be surprised if the the needs were somewhat similar um and did worship the daedra and interpreted them in a similar way to the reach in that more primal hunter gatherer kind of way i think one thing that's interesting about that whole point you just brought up is is kind of the idea that Daedra worship and the way Daedra manifest is kind of a two-way street. So, for example, rather than, say, Molag Bao coming along to certain alien kingdoms and showing them the wonders of torture, perhaps the, the more negative sides of the mortal mind and the mortal heart and how corrupted they could be, 
is reflected in the prince. And say, for example, you've got Molag Bal, who, say in the Khajiit pantheon, he's kind of just a troublemaker who wants to break through the lattice. But then with the Aelids, there are certain groups who are like, oh, they're embracing torturing these victims, and they're taking a lot of pleasure from it. It's easy for them to palm it off on a god, but then say they start worshipping Molag Bal as a result of this, and Molag Bal is getting all this worship, all of this, um, all of these people sucking up to him, he might be much more inclined to embrace this. It, it's a f- Making the Aedra and Daedra just reflections yeah. of the mortal personality mm. and all the flaws. Mm-hmm. And we should also just aspects. clarify, to, like, um, it's an interesting idea for sure, and I do, like, somewhat agree as well, but <clears throat> there's a distinction between this sort of idea of, like, the Aedra or whatever we know, the Divines or whatever, that basically gave up their power in creation being a little bit more of like an unconscious kind of uh, being. You don't really interact with them as much as as opposed to Daedra, which show up and like have their own sort of agency and so on. So, but I agree, like it could be interesting that the backwards influence, but it made me remember something that I was going to say that further gives us a little more clarity, like, well, it's just a theory, just a game theory, but potentially um, we could go, you could look at Tamriel and suggest, so how the Aelids begin, the Aelids come from Somerset and they establish some kingdoms. Um, Well, they're not really, they're like sort of paying tithes and whatnot back to Somerset or so on, but eventually they separate themselves. Um, And obviously they start up the whole like slaving Shamu thing. So what I was thinking though, is that we've already got like the men of Gi and the Duraki needs a star worshipping. I was thinking that, especially as a Daedra as well, Meridia might have actually played a decent part in um, in the Nedic uh, mythologies um, at the time. And also considering, and I was thinking that basically the Aelids came along, kind of wiped out a lot of the needs, kind of adopt and transform their culture, get obsessed with the stars, just like the, the sort of needs were, which separates them, you know, something different to the elves of Somerset. So making all of the wells and the Welkin stones and stuff like that, but then also really uh, getting in tight with uh, Meridia. Alternatively also, if the men of Gi, and maybe if you assume that religion was a little bit more widespread, they might have worshipped the Magna Gi, but we know that Meridia was like the bad Magna Gi that got cast out and so on. And maybe that's why the Aelids, she worked with the Aelids to enslave the others or the men who turned their back on her or something. And there's there's law precedent for for the idea of the Aelids kind of taking a a lot of inspiration from the places they conquer, Mm. what with the bird people of of Sirid. And there's no doubt that that culture would have had a lot of influence on their dress and, and things like that. Mm. Do you think that it's possible that the Dwemer, because obviously they love kind of astrology in, in, in the sense that they have all their star charts and orreries and, and, you know, the Dwemer studied planets and stars massively. And we know that the Dwemer also had some sort of interaction with needs at some point. Do we think that the needs could have gathered any inspiration from finding kind of like lost Dwemer things or any interaction there? Or do you think the Dwemer would have just subjugated them completely and annihilated them as inferior beings? The one thing to consider too is also the population of elves and is never as high as men and so on. I guess controlling large... I don't know. Like I, in the chrono... In the, I don't know if when Dwemer really... It's really hard to place, but when they really come into power like some of the ex- there's some dates for the expansion over like um skyrim which i think is a little incongruent with some of the information that when the falma because they kind of need to be there at the same time as the Fal- the snow elves so when the snow elves get beat out by um isgrimor and his return that they need to flee down to the to the dwarves and in exchange for their stuff but that implies it's already there so i would say skyrim and morrowind are basically the northern east somewhat mm-hmm. um had to be the they had to be there around that time but i don't know how powerful because remember the dwemer still like you know they got conquered by by a bunch of shouting screaming nords along with others and at the same time they were like competing with um other tri- um the tribal chimer and so on well actually it was high velothi culture at that point um at first then they would have you know, turned into the the more tribal chimera. And a thing to consider there too, there's a big difference is when we think in modern, in our modern world, we think of like, oh, if you have the better technology, you win, which is largely true when you can just take a machine gun and just, you know, level everything, right? Whereas if you have a crossbow or better technology and stuff, 
the other tribes have magic and all of this kind of stuff. They have like technology power, but through magic, they can sling fireballs and summon demons and do all kinds of stuff. So it isn't as just a hard, you know what I mean? Hard leveling ground. Like it's not as mm. slanted. What? And I mean, the idea of kind of cosmology potentially being picked up by the needs from some Dwemer influence. I don't know if the Dwemer would ever how much they would be willing to kind of share their secrets um, with just these savage men running around yeah. as well. Perhaps perhaps not. I, I mean, it is interesting too, speaking of kind of like Nedic Reachman crossover, but even the Reachmen actually have something to do um, with constellations um, and stars mm. as well. In the Elder Scrolls Online, you can talk to uh, a Reachman, Arana, and she talks about um, using the stars to see the future, basically. They call them sky tails. Um, and she says, that's what we call the shapes and the stars. Constellations is your word, I think. Some of my sisters can read the stars the way you read a book, see the future, learn the truth in every twinkle. I don't have the knack. It's fire and bones for me. But, you know, in terms of... Th there's some... Which need a group was that? Um, you know? Arana was formerly from the Ghost Song tribe, which has an intimate connection with Namira. Hmm. It's also worth noting, um, I, just to people in general too, is is that the Reachmen, and specifically you can imagine this is the way it is for a lot of the ancient Nedic tribes, like with specifics like, oh, men of Gi, and then there's this other group that might not necessarily worship Magna Gi the same, is that there's no big sort of formalized religion. It's probably like a lot of our ancient religions are a little bit more like open source religions there they'll like they'll like take other gods they like and deities and so on there's not really this sort of monolithic sort of um, monotheistic kind of you know doctrine as such there are to limited degrees but so what you could say is that there are lots of different tribes that this one might really be into namira like like the ghost song clan or there might be another that's really into cruel stuff and ripping hearts out or whatever the synth burn heart or fire heart or something where they rip their heart out and put coals fiery coals in their heart whatever but basically what i'm saying is that there could be a lot of uh diversity uh, along the different tribes in in gods they worship and it might even be certain tribes sort of pick patrons or something like that more or less but that even leads further i think to the idea that like daedra adra sort of they would have just picked whatever spirit's going to help them the, the most or is most relevant to them you know what i mean like i don't, I don't mm. it's hard to i mean we can also talk because we we're talking about like needing interaction I think what it seems like is needs sort of. I can't remember if there was needs in Morrowind. Sort I think of. there. I think there was. There is. Yeah. I think the. Um. I, I see Michael's checking, but I'm fairly sure the connection in the law was fairly threadbare because it was a description for an item found in ESO. Uh, is is where it comes from. So, so source for needs being in Morrowind. Is and I think there's a bit of dialogue based on that ESO. Um, item. It's t entirely possible. I, I don't have. I'm not sure which. I don't have an item as source here. I've got um that book that's in Morrowind, Oblivion, Skyrim, and Elder Scrolls Online: Frontier Conquest and Accommod uh and Accommodation: A Social History of Cyrodiil. Um, yeah. That, so that says these so-called Nedic peoples include the proto cyrodelians the ancestors of the Bretons, the Aboriginals of Hammerfell, and perhaps a now vanished human population of Morrowind. Well, so that's one source. Um, well, let's stick to pre-Elven. Like, just, just get a, a really firm grasp on, like, what the world kind of looks like. Mm. If we... If we go like pre-Elven, what we're talking about is pre-Ultima, really. Basically, the Somerset, Topol the Pilot comes around, they all come out and they're there. Now... Oh, sorry. Could I just... Yeah. I, I just found a little thing. Um it's a quest in the Elder Scrolls Online, mm -hmm. and at one part it says, The brothers will be confused as to why they have been summoned, but will offer you the tale of their sacrifice. Balreth and Sadal were powerful Kaima officers, but they could not stem the tide of the Nidic invasion. So that's a Nidic so it's, invasion. It's more yeah. insisting that they were invading as opposed to being... So there, there's yeah. that. Because if you, if you go back, so if we're going pre-Elven, so we're eliminating the Aelids, there's no Aelids, bird people and needs and step, perhaps, right? I could even be before... 
we don't know if the need the whole need story or when they got here, but more the needs, on needs invading, I found. Yeah. Okay. But also Bosma we can assume were there if you buy into the whole like we came from the ooze, if reshaped us kind of thing. We've always been in this green forest kind of thing. And then you assume the Khajiit come from a similar sort of thing. So the Khajiit were all there and that stacks up with the Topal the Pilots kind of thing. Which is weird though he didn't see the elves in Valenwood. Also weird he doesn't see the the snow elves of I, I would kind of almost go with the snow elves and maybe like survivors from like Altamora when the elves were kicked off or something and they sailed south or something or something like that. But when you first get there, we were, when you when we're not talking about that a point in time yet, when the Kaima haven't happened yet, Prophet Veloth hasn't gone off yet. So it's like, what did Morrowind look like then? And it's whether how like were the Dwemer there or if they were in just Bardenfell or very small timey kind of thing at the time. If you go really back far in the history, you can look at. Um, there's evidence to support that um, the ancient Argonian civilization even went as far as Red Mountain to like gather materials and stuff so you can imagine potentially Argonian outposts and so on from that um, area and you can imagine some natural like Nidic tribes spread but it's maybe there's some Dwemer there man maybe that's where they did get a thing for stars maybe the the Dwemer have just started out or something but it's so hard to like for me at least to think where did the Dwemer come from because when the Kaima came there they were able to contest them or, or there's some theories that are that, that, that the Dwemer are actually just a s split off the Kaima which is so like mm. sort of the Kaima so the Kaima come they find this brand new land that's a safe haven for them supposedly so it kind of makes silly that there'd be this oh there's this giant Dwemer powerful race there that's like living amongst them that you're diametrically opposed but rather you have this high Velothi culture kind of period then you have a split and you have um the Dwemer split off and go reclusive and like, you know, keep a little bit more of the, I don't know, academic side or something. And they, maybe they start developing the machines, but then you have the rest of the high velocity culture descends into the, or the, the Kaima sort of culture that's at the time of the tribunal, which is really uh, uh, pre tribunal, sorry, which is, you know, the worshiping the good danger and living as Ashlanders practically amongst the mm -hmm. ruins of their old civilization. So, yeah. It's interesting that they're called house Dwemer too. Mm. If you wanted to, like, put a little bit of, you know, sprinkle a little bit on that theory. Cause, yeah. Well, yeah, because normally it's just it's just palmed off as being, oh, this is kind of a diplomatic move by Nerevar to kind of bring them into the fold when they're trying to negotiate. But it could definitely go deeper than that, and we just don't know. Yeah, so perhaps it is that kind of, like, uh, sp split off or something. But basically what it's hard to say, it, does, it does, sounds silly to me that, that the Argonians were heading up towards the Red Mountain area and so on, and they encountered Dwemer I still feel like it'd be this very untouched sort of land at that time I don't know it just sounds because and it, yeah do you, do you see what I'm getting so at? Hard, it's so hard to math to it all say. out yeah Topol the pilot really met mucks with things a lot because he's really adamant basically if you followed his things you basically believe that there's no elves on Tamriel whatsoever whereas mm -hmm. if we go with the more modern sources you've got like uh Bosma and Khajiit, definitely both there. It If you try to line up, line up the timeline, I think the Snow Elves should be there, I think. Just just quickly, to be In fair, theory. Topol the pilot didn't travel through Tamriel, obviously. Mm. He traveled around the, the edges around the coast so i mean he traveled in to some bays and went to some place like a bit but generally speaking you're not going to be the best source on every race and civilization present at that time in tamriel mm. imagine just traveling around the coast of the world imagine yeah. traveling the coast of europe and then trying to say this is what's in europe the same thing he said he saw orcs um as as well mm. which i speculated once and like basically made this huge like cope chronological sort of um system to where that basically the goblins back there were much larger and taller and that was the term the term orc was used for them but then later and it might even be like connected to awesome because of corruption but later when the velothi um sorry the followers of trinomac get turned into orcs that we know them today they were called awesome but because they were tall and ugly they got grouped in with other green skins, the goblins. So they called them all orcs. But then later, the goblins got smaller and they started calling them goblins to like. Mm -hmm. to I, I do. Them. I honestly think that is the most realistic <clears throat> theory. Yeah. Because, you know, that would, it would make sense that they would be culturally known 
like or named after something they've already seen before that looks kind of similar to yeah, them. Yeah, well, I mean, if as opposed to explaining how somehow the orcs existed in High Rock, yeah, well, before any Elven in uh, movement. If you took because yeah. if you took like a like a really large goblin, which you can just call an orc, and then you see you know human oh not humans elves get turned into these tall large green tusk kind of things probably look very similar you go orcs like a derogatory sort of term you know it'd be um very easy to 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 sort that out but mm. um yeah well wait did weren't i'm not sure on the timeline of this but haven't the the ultima and maybe the ultima historically always enslaved goblins anyway or would or do you think that I think comes they did in somerset after? i think there were goblins in somerset that they ins- they enslaved so even locally they-, they would have had creature little green creatures or regardless of their size that they were looking at that they could then yeah. use as a term it, for it, it makes sense too that when picking kind of what the cursed elf would look like you know with the whole trinamac becoming malakath thing if the Daedric Prince responsible has some kind of subject matter, like, you know, oh, this mm. is like this, like, kind of mm. gross um, creature that we use as slaves on the island, you're going to kind of look like them. Which is typically what Daedric Princes do, is they create kind of imitations yeah, exactly. or corruptions of things they see from creation or creation of Mundus. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's interesting. But, if- um, so yeah, so po- poking some holes... That one can maybe be made sense of, but for the rest of it, it's kind of like you could say that maybe I, I kind of like the idea, and I think that if you think of the Dwemer having split off from the from the Velothi, the High Velothi culture period, and then sort of things progress from there, because it explains why they aren't necessarily so significant and so on. The one thing is the Snow Elves is to think of. I don't know how they fit in, and especially because there's books that talk about how um, there were Nedic tribes throughout Skyrim and so on. So maybe they were you know, a smaller group of survivors from Altmora or something. Mm. and But they have a very similar religion to the Ultima um, elves, but yeah. Yeah, there's, re- there's a lot of conflicting sources on the Snow Elves. Like, I just think it's like writers not considering, like, the full depth of the lore. Like, yeah. I, I, I may be wrong, but doesn't Gelabor kind of say, like, um, we've always been at war with the Nords or something like that, whereas the books kind of say, oh, they existed peacefully, everything was cool, and then there was, you know, the Night of Tears and the betrayal and, and you know, yeah. they were mad at each other. Like, I've just heard different things. Well, one thing to consider too is perhaps the amount of time that it took for... When Isgrimor first came, if you go, like, always been at war with the Nords, so Isgrimor came, there's a bit of peace, and then the, the Nord thing, the... Night of Tears happens, right? Um, and then they start attacking all the Snow Elves. But the Snow Elves don't necessarily, like, there could be, a, it could be a lot longer process than you think. Like, what I'm saying is, are there Snow Elves still living in small communities and stuff when the dragons are ruling over Skyrim or so on? Mm. Mm. I just found the quote, by the way, Gelibor does say, unfortunately, we were constantly at war with the Nords who claimed the land as their ancestral home. And so, well, claiming it as an ancestral home, that's another thing, sort of the idea that they were born on that land. So maybe we could explore, maybe this could go further. So if you talk about, so there's Ultimora, that elven kingdom. The Nords were in the armies of Shore, they were, but they were created by Kine on the throat of the world, and they're all fighting and so on. But then there's the big sundering, right? Then there's Atmora is separated from, from uh, Skyrim. But the Nords, the... Yeah, <laughs> sorry, throw me off. Just yeah, sorry. <laughs> we have a visitor. My cat wanted to. Get, my cat wanted to get on my. It doesn't house, matter. So no. Continue. <laughs> the Atmorans. Um, so basically, Ultimora, they kill off all the elves there, but there are some elves still left down here, and basically, um, so the Nords win against the elves up here, and maybe some flee down, but there's basically refuges of those first northern elves that beat out the Nords well, the Atmorans that were existing on Skyrim. And then, so then they've got Skyrim for themselves, but then obviously then Isgrimor and all of that come back down and they try and, you know, claim their homeland or so on. It, it's, we're trying to figure out like Dawn or very early or Marethic era kind of mm. stuff here. It's all kind of, mm-hmm. it gets I, even more confusing. Sorry, did you? No, no, no. I was just going to, I was going to try and get us on, on the topic of just gods. talking about some gods and well, some more I, obscure ancient gods i mean we can i mean you can't it's not it's not particularly interesting but the skull obviously with their worship of the all maker um mm. that feels very ancient because they've uh, basically got the all maker and the adversary and that's basically more or less it sort of seems like an anu padme kind of 
dynamic going but the on. The adversary can kind of have multiple um, like aspects. Like yeah. there are things that are like Tharstag uh, or Tharstag, the world devourer, mm. is an aspect of the adversary the Skull believe will come about. It's essentially, sounds like Alduin. Yeah. Um, and, and, and things of that nature. There are other really obscure gods mentioned in the lore that we could talk about. I know you love the fat bee mother. So uh, you're obsessed so with they, the fat mother. Uh, well, here's one theory in regards to that. So there's some another early Nedic tribe kind of thing. There's this fat bee mother that's mentioned, right? And I think there are a few sort of other animal-ish type gods and so on. But basically, because, you know, the bee um, and beehives are big great if you've got a hunter gatherer like you know big source of calories you could look at it as like nature's bounty it's like one of the sweetest things you can find in nature kind of thing so hunter gatherers you can see how that kind of thing would create some sort of relevance and maybe i don't know if it's connected to the insect god it being like a, a bee mm. but what's interesting is i was thinking there's obviously there were needs all around um Hammerfell at the time, native needs and so on. And the Red Guards came in and sort of wiped them out. And the last ones that were kind of there were the Duraki needs and they got wiped too. But maybe some of the early tribes there were actually this bee mother thing was quite um, prevalent because then when the Yukudans come, I was sort of thinking that they might have adopted some of the symbology. And because you know how there's statues and stuff depicting Morwa, sort of their version of Mara, holding, um, which is also like a mothery type goddess, they're holding uh, the beehive. And so on, so on. So I was actually thinking it was something that the Yakutans actually um, adopted, just in terms of the symbology and stuff um, from that. So basically, it makes me think, though, that the need sort of this bee mother was sort of their like Mara kind of figure or something. Um, mm hmm. Mm. But, yeah. uh, the children well, smiled great smiles and asked the Abba for a big gob of honey from the fat mother. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I mean, since we were talking a little bit about Isgrimor and, and the Nords, it, it does it seems obvious when you don't really think about it, but when you've got the Songs of the, of the Return and you've got some of these um, at Morans coming down and finding Whiterun, it, it's, allu it's very heavily alluded to that the Skyforge was something that predated the Elves. Mm -hmm. So it's that the eagle that you see there isn't necessarily Auriel because you have a sentence that says... Um, they asked of their elven captives, or I'll go back a tiny bit further, why have the elves not, vile to their core, seen to exploit and tame this land fit for harvest? They asked the elven captives uh, what they found so unfit about these plains, yet even the, captain, even the captives who still bore their tongues could say nothing of the valley. They looked with fear at the winged colossus, and from their babblings did the warriors of Yorvaska learn that it was older even than the elves. Maybe. Maybe also, potentially, it's not necessarily Eagle or Aurel. That sort of seems like it might be some later sort of some set kind of stuff. Maybe it, mm. I mean, a bird person could correct me on this, but like maybe it's trying to depict a hawk. Or even you could argue eagles, hawks, or whatever, because the hawk is the symbol of kind and so on, and that's relevant to mm. that. Morans, kind created the, the, the proto Nords at Morans, whatever, on the throat of the world. They built this, and then perhaps it's one of the left, leftover things um, in Skyrim. Um, after the sundering happened and then so the Nords yeah. come back they come back and they've even forgotten that you know their connection to this eagle or whatever they don't understand it but they know that that if mm -hmm. you looked at it it was actually which would be yeah oh. which would be evidence for them having been born on the throat of the world as opposed to in Atmora yeah mm. yeah it, it's an interesting sort of uh, uh, way to to look at look at it one thing I actually will also want to talk about as well um, which can kind of frame this because we kind of brought up Calpers and stuff. We want to sort of keep it talking about gods and stuff a bit. And there's this whole idea that whatever being Akatosh, whatever you want to call it, right? The Aka, whatever, time god, the Cal it ends the Calper at some point and Alduin comes as a world eater, sort of dragon and ends everything. But he turns against his role and then decided, I just want to rule the world. Um, and then they sent him forward in time with the Elder Scrolls. But because that is happening, that is about in the Morethic era, and we've got no like concrete dates or amounts of time in the Morethic. Very few. I think there's something like between a thousand and eight hundred and thousand years before the first era starts is the period when men supposedly started coming. That's the migration theory. Yeah, and then we have that one source. And I think the, like before the ages of man or something. Yeah, and Isgrimor's that. arrival based on I think what Codlack White Man said Wayne says about Mine. the companions being like five thousand years old that that would place 
Isgrimoire's return at around 500 years before the first era. So Isgrimoire mm-hmm. came, then the whole um, dragon cult thing sort of rose up and all of that kind of stuff happened within the 500 years between Isgrimoire's return and the start of the first era. But the point is, around that time with that old dragon cult thing, and maybe that's why, because the dragon cult sort of formed, Aldon's like, yeah, I love it. I'm going to rule this world. But he was supposed to end the world around that time, which implies the Kalpers maybe before have been much much shorter Mm -hmm. um because otherwise you've kind of extended this one artificially by another four and a half thousand years and also it's interesting but maybe that is why akatosh uh made the pact to keep them the daedra out because the day it to sort of like akatosh became invested in sort of let's just keep this one going instead Mm -hmm. of each kalpa being this crazy relived war kind of thing hey maybe in a way akatosh or whatever being whatever doesn't uh, want um, to get to the dawn era again because if you go back there you've got to go back to war and relive all that yeah. and fighting well, and everything gets muddled it a, again it's like trying to find a it way is a out com- it's a combination as well because you've got Alduin who can end the world but as we saw with Lig it doesn't necessarily have to be him who ends the world because you know that that covenant is made which stops characters like Molag Bal coming in and just enslaving the whole realm mm. and then when that happened obviously Merun's Dagon was created in the bowels of Lig to unmake that world you know you hear the term Numantia which is li- liberty and freedom from creation so the covenant combined with Alduin being sent forward in time is the perfect combo to ensure the longevity of the mortal realm this time around it's why it's why again i'm really i'm pretty set on the idea of lig being like a non-existence place or it exists adjacent in a previous mm-hmm. like with a circle kind of idea if you a ring if you imagine each one is a wheel but it's like next to it over there that tamriel and lig didn't coexist in the same like calper at a time it really is of the previous um place and then going forward yeah it's, and then it, you know like yeah like you're sort of saying interesting to see the way the gods fight over and how they like come into the next into the next Kalpa at the end of the day we can only really talk about like Kalpa like I know it can sound so crazy to like people listening they're like what the hell is this because then you, it, there's theoretically like infinite possibilities and we do know parts though sort of because the dawn era is both the beginning and the end um or end of the previous and beginning of the new it kind of some elements kind of bleed in. So, for example, like Dregs, the idea that they're here and sort of in this world, and then there's like Umaril who says, you know, his father's from the World River or whatever of the previous Kalper mm-hmm. or something. Like, there's a lot of uh, interesting takeaways from well, that. Well, speaking of the end of the world, there is one tale that we haven't mentioned, and I really just have to mention it because we're talking about ancient gods and needs and things like that. But there is this whole thing about an event known as the Autumn of Snakes, which Ooh, according yeah. to a bunch of Nedic texts was when hundreds of snakes the size of mammoths come out of the ground and just basically eat whole towns and basically destroy everything until this Nedic hero, this spear maiden named Ranev the Coal-Eyed Wanderer comes and, you know, basically stops it. Um, there's all these stories, they all describe it in the same kind of meticulous detail. In the Elder Scrolls Online, there's scholars who obviously think that it's a rubbish story, um, and, and obviously point out that just because this story is widespread doesn't mean it's true, but we don't tend to cast doubt on the mythology of the Elder Scrolls, and it's a Mm. cool little prophecy to see. It's also interesting, too, that their hero to save the day was a spear maiden, um, which you could draw probably multiple connections to, but interestingly, if her scene was like a... I know it's female, mm. but if her scene was like a god of um, needs, as he was a god, a chief god of the Reachman pantheon, who, you know, are influenced by... Well, they have Nedic influence. Mm. It would be interesting if that was almost like a... Either an incarn- like an aspect of her scene or, or something like that. It's quite interesting. Well, like... Saying that, yeah, definitely, that's a good connection that her scene one there too, because he's kind of the they call like the world of the rule of the world of flesh or whatever, um, mm-hmm. the mortal realm. But and he's you know, you can see why it's so important, like the most basic fundamentals, like pray, um, 
predator kind of thing it, you know the primeval world but another thing there too is the autumn of snakes mentioning that and that being a world ending thing it might also all be talking about the same aspect so there's, there is every single i'm pretty sure every single one has some sort of at the at the least a reptilian aspect so satakal is envisioned as a snake there's the autumn of snakes uh, Alduin is a dragon and comes to eat the world. It's always this kind of like reptile scaled, scaled element. beast, yeah. Yeah, and and interestingly, I mean, that's another thing um, in our real world mythologies. Like snakes often appear as the villain and that's why dragons and stuff, so on. And it's been, a, it's a very like, some anthropologists sort of like speculate because it's a very natural like enemy and very other. It's like not a mammal. It's a very like, um, it's a troublesome uh, uh, creature and then that's all become different things in there. Uh, mythologies and, and symbolism and so on but it's interesting that maybe that autumn of snakes is maybe it's even a stylistic uh talk about alduin trying to eat the world or something at that time or or maybe it is literally an autumn of snakes but maybe it, what i'm saying is the idea is that most things related to a world ending or beginning or the time cycle are always some sort of snake or reptilian kind of thing and perhaps it was maybe she actually did stop some autumn of snakes kind of thing. And it also leads me to believe that a lot of the, the needs, early needed kind of stuff, it's a lot of probably quite similar to that, more of the like animal symbolism, like the fat bee mother, the autumn of snakes, if you envision the snakes as some like world ending sort of kind of thing. Like a, a, a bit more, and it, like how, you know, humans did it in our own real world. Like you, you take the pieces of your environment and you grant it metaphysical sort of meaning and spirituality like kind of i i guess almost like an early form of like animism kind of kind of thing but mm. but yeah mm. it's interesting uh ranev the hero of that story actually has more to her and it says uh at the end of one of her tales it says the virtues of the stars started singing inside her and she pledged to uphold these words until she died after this time, she was called Ranev, the favorite of the stars. So there's even more ties to kind of like celestial um, mm. type things. I, I'm always pretty convinced of that connection. You said the, the her scene thing too, because between I kind of getting a, uh, maybe you guys are getting, the people listening are getting an image too. But the way I'm understanding the needs more um, of pre sort of elven colonization, all that kind of stuff and pre Nords. Um, returning and all of that kind of thing um that they were much like the reachmen but with this massive sort of star gazing element like the stars seem prevalent across a few different groups at the at, at the very least the idea that the aelids sort of adopted perhaps the star worship and the star focus and stuff from the local needs that were there but then also i, I sort of feel like this sort of her scene kind of just worshipping different Daedra as manifestations of the world as it is rather than like something mm. malevolent. I, I went to mention this before, but when you, you're sort of bringing up like, you know, every there's like books, you read Book of the Daedra, it's like, it basically reads as like, oh, this is a book of evil spirits and these are the cults that are evil and follow them. But if you look at a Reachman perspective, a lot of them, it's just like, it just is the way it is. They're not necessarily evil or anything, but like, you know, mm is it evil when a lion kills a gazelle kind of thing and like tears it mm. apart alive or is like or is it just a facet of the world i think they a lot of the ancient stuff takes it just as this is just what the real world is and then some of the daedra manifestation of that like dagon with the environment and it, it, um yeah it, it's interesting when you read a, a book about ranev called the raneviad volume two um there's a lot of kind of like strong warrior associations there like singing a warrior hymn and meditating in front of this kind of shrine before going out on this pilgrimage where she has to seek six virtues of the stars um, that are carved in stone and basically at each site. And I mean, you could tie this to her scene um, and, and the hunt and, and the hunter, but you could also tie it to um, older and more ancient interpretations of kine as we see in Skyrim where there's kind sacred trials and you have to go and slay these creatures <laughs> mm. to prove yourself. Cattail there. Oh, um, at add. each, sorry, I was just going to say at each site, the warrior had to overcome dangerous creatures, foul beasts and other challenges to find the prayer markers and receive the six virtues. Um, to add that, to, just before I forget, um, the other star worshipping thing, the doom stones that are all hanging mm -hmm. around the megalithic yeah, yeah, structures yeah. all throughout Cyrodiil, just more star worshipping, star focused stuff. But interestingly there too, um, there are some like uh, ancient sort of Greek 
kind of things that they're putting with the needs, which I'm kind of a fan of. I like little bits and so on, like the Reneviad. Or what is it? Was it? Yeah, mm-hmm. Reneviad, yeah. Reneviad, like the Iliad. Yeah. Like, but also there's uh, there's a depiction of the Celestials, I think, defeating the Serpent um, on, and it's kind of got like the the square around. I'll put it up on the screen, but it's another sort of looks like a ancient Greek fresco and stuff. And also spear being like a massive thing of like a hoplite. It's the classic sort of weapon of classical period. Or if you go further, it's spear is like the most, you know, effective it's such an wartime ancient thing. weapon. Yeah. I mean, even, mm. even you look at the centaurs who are considered to be true followers of the old ways. Mm. Weapon of choice, spear. Yeah. They're all like, yeah. It's and I think it is just important to mention as well when talking about the needs and even potentially the snakes is Periite is also an important figure to them. And he's, he's kind of like associated with natural order and time, which kind of gives him the dragon elements. Mm. But he is also kind of a snake. It's a snake dragon. Mm. Um, so there is the, you know, the uh, uh, no, I, I almost perceive the autumn of snakes as somehow being involved with him as well. Maybe, maybe that's another... Well, because to... If we're using the Reachman, which is also, it's it's a relatively close sort of um, area, but if we're using the Reachman as a sort of like template to think about it, and if if you sort of take the the, um, premise that perhaps ancient needs looked at them the same way and that the Daedric princes aren't this necessarily malevolent thing, they just is what it is kind of thing. So Mm -hmm. you've got like the... the, um, period and so on bringing disease and all of that kind of stuff was like compared to like you know forest fires that help regenerate things areas it's like the natural sort of cycles of things and then maybe in that way period was like associated with like some sort of autumn of snakes kind of thing but maybe that's also a bad thing like you know staving off the the cycle maybe that's that point of transition between sort of like the civilized because once you get to sort of civil like i guess you could look at the dichotomy between hunter gatherer tribes in general this is very general to say but even of our real world are very like oh you know exist in the world there's cycles and stuff you live and die a new generation comes you know you don't take too much from the forest because otherwise i won't come back you know what i mean it's very preserving of a cyclical kind of nature of things but when you get to civilization it's like i want to last forever this is really good let's get going Mm -hmm. go 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 so it might actually be and things like writing about it like the reneviad or something um is comparable to like some of like you know our earliest sort of um you know, the Iliad written about, you know, the Iliad's writing about Troy and stuff, which is set in the Bronze Age, which is really early times. Like, you could sort of see that maybe that whole point of time is a transition between the Nedic sort of hunter-gatherer tribes and then starting to turn into the more modern um, needs and stuff. And then, obviously, they'll get assimilated and stuff later. But, like, there's a far cry between the Duraki needs and sort of perhaps the Reachmen close by. Mm-hmm. And I think the Reachmen would be more like tribes originally Nedic tribes that worshipped Daedra and basically didn't get as civilized as the stone masons of of um the Duraki because that's what they were known mm. for all of their stone which also ties them again to the megaliths um the big doom stones and stuff and the star worship that the Dura- that the needs were um yeah and i mean uh one more other group of potentially ancient gods is we've said this before and say it again but there is nothing innately malevolent about being daedric mm. if you take it to mean that daedric is just not being involved with the creation of the world which is what makes me think that the daedric prince is being 16 maybe the you know you can tie it all into this wheel but the idea that there are a lot there are so many other forces that were spawned during creation so many original spirits so many atada that may just have had no interest whatsoever in being involved being involved in creation because there's a we've just put a video up on the channel about uh, a, a realm called Fargrave, which is a new Daedric realm that's kind of being explored. And there's there's theories about its creation, but nothing set in stone. But one of these theories is that there were four Daedric princes who created the world in collaboration, but eventually clashed and turned on one another, and they all killed each other. Alternatively, there's the idea that they were simply kind of mindless gods that carried this world around between planes of oblivion almost as a form of transport so that um, people could navigate oblivion much better and so that Daedric princes could communicate better but basically the idea is that the these gods if if they were gods would have had no interest in being a part of creation so they wouldn't be they wouldn't obviously they aren't Adric, but they're Daedric by nature for not being involved. Mm-hmm. So the bearers of Fargrave are also potentially ancient gods that cease to exist. Yeah, I, I guess is an interesting. Well, and this is kind of uh, the Dwemer point of view, but like 
what even classifies a god and usually it is um you would say like worship or the thing around it like you know whether like the dwemer for example there's this con thing like they call them like uh people get frustrated when they use the term atheist right but atheist is like not having a god and so on if you can recognize but they're like oh but gods are real in the world like no gods aren't real the beings are real over bad but they like the city god and go oh they're just super powerful spirits doesn't mean they're a god i don't worship them they don't have a system of worship surrounding these beings where mm-hmm. you can still recognize super powerful yeah. um, beings but in regard um in regards to that it's kind of like what constitutes a daedric prince and usually we'll like say they like own a realm of oblivion but like that like do they get worshipped by other Daedra or like, do they have mm. to like, you know, how does that work or what, like what classifies as a God really? Like mm. there might be systems of worship. We don't I mean, even the Khajiit call them spirits. Yeah. Like mm. as, as their main thing, but they still consider them, I suppose, gods. Although it is interesting. If you look at the old school, the uh, ancient Khajiit kind of stuff with Daedra, it kind of matches um, a bit with, the Reachmen and their religion in the sense that they don't venerate these Daedra in a traditional way. Like I know Boethra is one that the Khajiit kind of, they just, you do it. You don't worship it. You, you live that mm. kind of, you mm-hmm. live those values. Um, yeah. You walk that path and that's kind of your way of venerating them. You don't grovel on your knees. A pre, a pre, pre Elven Tamriel, the, it seems like a lot of uh, exotic and interesting because assuming the Khajiit are there, the early Khajiit are there and the Bosma are there. And then you have like Nidic tribes and all that kind of stuff. This seems like a lot of variation. It, it kind of always seems like the elves came along and they changed things a lot and made everything a lot more dogmatic. Mm. To, just not, to be fair, it's not entirely their thing because when it was really, I guess, Alicia that kind of combine the two pantheons and then made the one size fits all and i mean there was even the elysian order which was another really like further attempt at a at a sort of truth which is the closest thing to you know monotheism you get but they're just the one Mm -hmm. and it's interesting i never knew this connection so on but that's why there is the temple of the one oh yeah in the imperial city like when i was a kid i had no idea any of this lore so on but that is the one temple like just Mm -hmm. the god of everything which Probably like the closest to the truth if you want to if you want to buy into like a, a godhead kind of you know idea, but mm-hmm. but yeah, there's well, so there's so much there is. <laughs> I feel like we could just speculate on on gods all day long, but I suppose we will always have more podcast episodes to to talk about the gods. So thank you everyone for for tuning into this episode. I'm pretty sure it's time to wrap it up. Uh, We have social media links down in the description for anyone interested in following us on Twitter. Uh, You can get an awesome Fudge Muppet t-shirt by clicking our merch uh, (laughs) (laughs) merch link if you desire. And we look forward to nerding out with you again very soon.